Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Yu Chen. So I'm a PhD student from Carnegie Mellon University and uh, thank you so much for having me. And um, it's really my great honor to present at this year's conference. So today I'm going to talk about a problem that has been frustrating for both industry and academia for a pretty long time. That is the non-availability of the data. So such inaccessibility to the data have been a main stumbling block for many key research and industry advances. And now we may have a potential solution so our recent work next year, so which appears, uh, appears at this year's CICOM, and I encourage you to, you'd like to check it out, um, sheds light on the first step towards solving this data availability and sharing problem in terms of the networking traces. So uh, this is a joint work with my colleagues at CMU, uh, Minghan and Zinan, and also my uh, advisors, Professor Julia Fenty and Professor Via Saika. So here's the basic context for this work. So we all know that like data-driven research has been super important and pioneering in today's networking and systems research. And uh, they enable like a bunch of applications we have seen like in the past two days. So for example, from the data, we can predict the network reliability. We can predict the video quality given like a particular networking uh, transmission conditions. And of, of course, we can evaluate a bunch of algorithms um, based on the data set and compare with, with them against each other. Also like a bunch of security related applications, for example, injury detection, Anomaly detection also benefits from this data set. So, however, there are a bunch of pain points existing for both academia and the industry. So, one such pain point for academia is the reproducibility crisis. So, many industry track papers and company researches are not reproducible due to the lack of the data, uh, since the companies are, in general, not willing to share their sensitive data set with uh, outside researchers, not to mention like other companies. So. We have to admit that like many companies are now choose to open source their data set, which is definitely great, but the data is still not available and becomes a new stumbling block. So beyond that, so another pain point for academia is, is the collaboration crisis. So usually unless the researchers are part of the companies or uh, either through employment, internship or visiting company, so it's nearly impossible for them to access the private data sets. So it's definitely bad like for the researchers, but on the other side, for the company, this is also suboptimal. So the potential collaboration between the academia and the companies also gone tapped. So if you think such pain points only exist like for uh, academia, then that's not the case. From our talk with the, a lot of like uh, networking product vendors, so the fact that uh, throughout their product life cycle, the fact that they cannot store or access these historical traces is actually causing a bunch of issues for their uh, workflows. So for example here, for data science teams, so without access to a, these abundant high quality data sets, they cannot build the robust ML models. And for the testing and the response team, so when the clients come to complain about their problem, say, hey, I have a problem and you, I want you to debug it for me then the testing and response team usually spend a ridiculous amount of time to try to reproduce the incidents, just simply because they are not sharing the traces. So somehow to sort of like tackle the status quo or to get away from it, so we present our vision next year. Of course, this is just like first step towards a bigger picture. So we start from the header traces, for example, the PCAPs and NetFlows. So we have pre pretty like familiar with it. So um, so, the, so for the next year, the user needs to provide two inputs. So the first is the fidelity matrix, for example, the matrix that the user care about, for example, distribution of IPs, poor numbers, or like the distribution of packet sizes. And another thing is about the privacy matrix that the user wants to hide. For example, I don't want to reveal my IP address or I want to hide a particular distribution of a specific field. So after that, so next year take these inputs and it will generate high fidelity privacy preserving synthetic header traces, which enables like a network analytic workflow, which enables a much more robust models, reduce the cost and have a uh, faster development and test time. So notice that like the synthetic data and the raw data shares the exact same format. So for example, if your input is a PCAP, the output will also be a PCAP. So this entire workflow will be low friction and backwards compatible. So that's pretty much of it. So next, um, I'll go over a little bit of the background and especially GANs. So what are GANs? Why GANs like signing and why we use it? So here's a very high level taxonomy of the 
synthetic trace generation. And there are so many net networking traffic generators on the market, and I believe many of you have used it like uh, at some point, like for your projects. And I talked to Christine like yesterday. So like 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 nowadays, like people use five or six different traffic generators for their different needs and scenarios. And if we have like one unified traffic generator that can satisfy all of these needs, that would be, that would like be the best case. So. Usually, like these traditional um, traffic generators fall into the previous category we call the non-machine learning approaches. So, including the simulation models, for example, the NF3 or GNF3, so pretty famous, and some structured models from the academia, for example, Harpoon and Swing. So, one downside of such method is that so it usually requires too much human efforts and domain expertise. So, usually, you need a lot of time to hand tune that and make the work to meet your properties that you want. Also, like for different need, different scenarios, different data sets, you may need different generators, which is definitely not good. So another big category, so in contrast to these traditional approaches, is what we call machine learning based approaches. And one big category of them is what we call generative models. So as you may heard, like some buzzing words, GANs or deep fake. So as introduced like in 2014, firstly, so GANs has now been one of the most uh, I would say popular and like successful generative models. So these models, they are great, they are promising, so, but they are just not e effectively designed for network traces. So we believe that network traces are unique beasts that like uh, off the shelf machine learning techniques just cannot cut. So finally, GANs. So what are GANs? So the forename for GANs is called the Generative Adversarial Networks. And uh, its most successful application is in, in the image domains. And uh, just as an example shown here, so let's say given like an input data set, which is a human faces, and GANs are able to take that data set and uh, generate high fidelity, photorealistic, synthetic human faces. So one big benefit of GANs is that so it can learn the high dimensional correlations within these data set with a much less human expertise. So again, in this example, so for human faces, so GANs does not need to be told the some like typical human features, human face features, for example, like your eyes should be on above the nose or like mouth should be, should be below the nose. So GANs can automatically capture that, so which makes it, it like a exceptional candidate for generating network traces because the network traces usually have very complicated correlations with different fields. So based on all of these like pain points, insights, advances in techniques, so our real motivating question is that, so can we build on top of GANs to generate synthetic header traces with the good trade-offs below, um, like with the following, like three aspects. So first is the fidelity, that we want our synthetic trace and the real trace to be statistically similar and also practically similar. The second thing is about the uh, scalability. So you may, you may also know that like uh, right now we have a lot of like these large models and they may use like a 1,000 GPU cluster to like train for one month. We don't want our models to, to be that. So we want our models to be trained like with a reasonable amount of like resources and time. So the third is also the most important is the privacy. So if we want to incentivize different people and companies to use this tool, so privacy has to be upfront. So next I will go over some like key challenges and ideas like how we tackle this problem. So uh, maybe before diving like to the technical details, let's look at like a seemingly like natural straw man solution. So given that you have known the tools of GANs, so it's a really great generative models, and I'm pretty sure all of you are super familiar with PCAM and NetFlows. So one natural and simple idea that why don't we just take the trace and model it as like a table or like a CSV file, where each line is just like a single packet or NetFlow record and feed into what we call tabular GANs. So then down this end of the story, so however, that's not the case, so at least from the empirical experiments. So what we found that uh, you will see like in the next few slides is that so such simple method, although it's attractive, it's simple, but it just does not work. It does not meet the needs like for these network traces. So the challenge is really like resides into the three aspects I, ha I have just described. So fidelity, scalability, and the privacy. So the first two is the fidelity like uh, uh, challenges, which we need to capture the correlations between these different header fields, for example, flow size distributions, interarrival times, and also for these networking traces, we usually have like a bunch of fields with a large support. For example, IP address or like in the NetFlow data set, we have some like the, let's say the number of bytes for a particular flow. These can go unbounded theoretically like for a particular data set. 
And third and, uh, second and third is the scalability and the privacy we have just described. So the first challenge uh, of the fidelity is really about the head of field correlations. So here I give like two examples. So the left figure shows the number of reports with the same five tuple in the NetFlow data set. And for the right figure, it shows the flow size distribution measured as like a number of packets per flow in the PCAP. So what we find is that so all these baselines, including the state of the art uh, tabular GAMs, uh, we call it CT GAM, the second one here, they all fail like to capture these correlations. So actually they are very far from perfect. So the, the reason behind that we think is that so they are using like the wrong abstraction that I just described, so the seemingly natural Strowman. That is the trace is treated as like a, like different single packets and feed into this tabular base again. So each packet is generated independently. So, so in contrast to that, so we think the right uh, formulation or the right abstraction should, should to re reformulate this, this thing as a time series generation problem. So in our case, let's say given a series of data, maybe let's say from different measurement epochs from day one to day n, the first thing we do is to we merge it into a large trace and we do a flow based split based on five tuples. And in contrast to tabular GANs, we feed into a time series GAN. Well, each sample is a series of packets, is a flow. So this packet can contain the packet size, uh, timestamp, and different fields of I mean, every individual packet. But this is in contrast like to the case in the tabular GAN, where each sample is a simple packet. So by this way, we are able like, to capture the header field correlations much better. So the second challenge resides in like, the modeling these particular fields with the large support. So unlike the images where like, each pixel is just like, uh, uh, like, uh, like has, a, has a, like, a fixed value from 0 to 1 or 0 to 255. So these NetFlow data sets usually have like, these fields with, with like, large support. So again, I gave like, two examples. The left figure shows the number of packets for each flow, which can go super large um, for, for a particular data set. And the right side is the top K service, like uh, Paul numbers, uh, DNS, HTTP, or like HTTPS. So what we can see that like the baselines with these simple encodings is, are not able to capture all of this stuff. So instead of like using the simple encodings, so encoding is like one important aspect like in the pre-processing of all these machine learning algorithms, so we consider, we take into consideration of all these three aspects we just mentioned, fidelity, scalability, and, and privacy. So we use a structure well domain specific encoding. And in summary, like uh, after considering all these factors, so Nashir uses like a uh, bit encoding for IP address embedded vector representation, which we call IP2VAC, which is similar to word 2 vac from the NLP community. And use these encodings, we can boost the performance of like these different fields so the third challenge is really about the, or like the second big aspect of the challenge is really about the scalability. So all of these baselines, including our own prior work, are suffering from the scalabilities. So here we measure the fidelity as a metric in the y-axis, which we call the Jason Shannon divergence. So which is just a metric uh, essentially measures how close the real and the synthetic trace is. And here the x-axis, we measure the uh, scalability as the training time in the CPU hours. So um, the reason that we don't use GPU hours is, is we just we don't have in, enough GPUs. And if any, of, if any of you like wants to donate us like GPU cluster, we are very happy to take it. So, but just like heads up that like using GPUs will not change the general takeaway. It may reduce the all methods training time by like by let's say one or two's magnitude, but the general takeaway should not change. So. We try to investigate like why the, these baselines and the naive approach had the very poor fidelity or uh, scalability. So basically that, so for all these strawmans, so you feed the entire flow trace very large into the time series scan. So basically you are suffering from two uh, very, very slow, slow, slow points. So the first is that, so this, this trace is, is usually like super large because today's network is super high speed, 40G, 100G. And the second thing is that, so, Due to this large size, you may run the risk of like blowing up your either RAM or like GPU memories if you are using GPUs. So we use some ideas like from the machine learning community to tackle this scalability problem. So basically called fine tuning. So instead of like training the whole flow trace as a single town, so we slice this large flow trace into different chunks, smaller chunks, and we use the first chunk as a warm up or we call it a seed chunk. And all the following chunks 
are trained based on the first chunk and the training is happening in parallel. So basically with this workflow, we have two speed ups. So the first is that, so the subsequent chunks are not training from scratch. So it's from a baseline model or we call it foundation model. And second thing is that, so this, uh, these chunks training are happening in parallel instead of like in sequential. So we empirically find that so with such a workflow, we can reduce the total training time by up to four times for different data sets. And the last challenge, the third challenge, uh, is about the privacy. So the first question we may need to answer is the what privacy metrics should we use? So here we use one thing, um, one leading metric from the literature called differential privacy. So we know that this is not maybe the most optimal or best metrics uh, in terms of like measuring privacy, but this is somehow best of the worst metric we can use. Um, cons like consider if we want to compare against like these baselines and prior works. So the quick takeaway is that so naively applying this differential privacy trick, or we call it DP, so it, dis it totally destroys the fidelity even with very weak guarantees. So if we look at like how this like technique works, it's basically super uh, simple. So basically you just add the differentially private SGD to the, re re like the regular GANs and you feed your private uh, traces into this model. So however, we think this is not necessary. So we don't need to train the uh, entire private trace, uh, the, the entire private model on this private traces. However, again, we use some idea from the ML community. That is, we take a small amount of public data, then we get a pre-trained public model. Then we, then we train our private models based on this pre-trained public models. And after that, so we get our synthetic trace. And we can, so beyond that, we can still do some optional privacy extensions. For example, we can remap, remap our IP ranges uh, from the public IPs to private, so just not to reveal identity. And also we can hide some attributes that you care most about. So just as a quick wrap up, uh, I, so putting everything together, here's like an end-to-end -end overview. So let's say given a data set um, with multiple epochs from maybe the measurement epochs from day one to day n. So first thing we do is to merge into a large trace. Then we do a flow-based split based on five tuples. Then we encode it with a domain-specific encoding and slice into smaller chunks. And then we use these techniques we call like incremental fine-tuning. And all these chunks training are happening in parallel. And in the end, we merge these synthetic data chunks into one large trace. And beyond that, we can do these optional uh, extensions. So these are pretty much all the key ideas, key challenges like to achieve, uh, to design the next year. So next, I will talk a little bit about the, how, we evaluate, evaluate, uh, how we evaluate the system and how we implement it. So the first part of the, the evaluation is really about the mathematical or we call like field distributions. So here again, we use the Jason Shannon divergence in the y-axis. So just remember again, so uh, this is the metric that measures how close the real and the synthetic trace is. And the x-axis um, represents like different metrics, source address, this destination address, port number, protocols. And we have like a bunch of other metrics to not show here. So uh, I encourage you like to check out, check out the paper. So we also evaluate the year over different scenarios, different data sets, not just a single data set or single setup. So for example, the internet backbones, the data center traces, and some malicious attack traces. And we find that so across all these feature distributions, across all these data set traces, so it achieves like almost 46 better fidelity compared with the baselines. So that's uh, just like one part of the evaluation. So so after that, you, 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 like people may ask, like we actually got some feedback there. So these numbers are great, so m math is good, but still we are not confident that whether the data generated by this tool can be practically used for the applications. So we choose like three different applications from different like uh, categories. So the first one is we, what we call flow-based traffic type prediction. And for each application, we measure two things. So the first thing we measure is what we call accuracy preservation. So imagine that like you have a synthetic data set and you have a model. You train this model on synthetic data and you test it on the real data. So this is the number one, so accuracy number one. Then you have another scenario where you train and test the model all on the real data. So that's the accuracy number two. So we want these two numbers to be as close as possible, which means that the synthetic data is actually practical for these applications. So we find that for this particular application, so across these class files, decision tree, linear regression, random forest, and so on and so forth. So compared with the baseline, so it achieves the best accuracy, so compared with the real data. So that's just like one part of the 
application evaluation. So another important aspect is, is what we call um, uh, ranking preservations. So usually like you have a set of algorithms you want to compare with each other. So let's say algorithm A is greater than B like on the real data. So you want these rankings or correlations to be preserved also on the synthetic data. So here we use like some uh, correlation numbers to measure it, but just like the higher is better. So we find that although not perfect, so 1.0 means a perfect number, perfect match. So it still preserves the rankings best among all these baselines. So second application we choose is from the telemetry world. So using some sketching algorithm to do the heavy hair detection. So again, for the accuracy preservation, what we find that, so compared with the baselines and across all these uh, different sketching algorithms, so it achieves almost like 48 smaller relative arrows. And again, for the ranking preservations, so for this particular algorithm, so our to achieve the perfect rankings across all these data sets and have hitters of interest. So the third application is security related, uh, which we use open source header based anomaly detection called NetML, uh, developed by University of Chicago. And um, similarly, for the accuracy like uh, preservation, we find that so on most data sets and modes of the NetML, so yeah, we do see like for some modes and data sets, the net share achieves the second best like a relative arrow. So on most of them, so it achieves a lower relative arrow compared with the baselines. So again, for the rankings, so it's still the best among all these baselines. And that's pretty much all for the evaluation and validation. So here's like for the implementation. So try to ease the use of like net share. So we implement as a Python package and it's all, all open source on GitHub. So installation is pretty easy like by the standard Python installation. And the, the example usage is also simple, just a few lines of code. So basically two parts, you have a driver code on the left hand side. So basically uh, specify a model. And on, on the right, right hand side is the configuration files, which essentially specifies which original data file you're using and what kind of data set type you are generating from, PCAP, NetFlow, or some other data sets. So besides that, so we also have like a prototype web service, it's, which is hosted on pcapshare.com. So, but just remember that, so this is just like a, uh, uh, like a dashboard or demo service. So we just don't have enough cloud credits to host like everyone's requests. But, but basically this dashboard just like visualize like how well for different metrics, like how well your synthetic data compares to the real data. So that's pretty much all like for the next year. So working on the PCAPs and NetFlows. So beyond this point, you have learned that, okay, next year is, is a good tool. So uh, it can generate some like good PCAPs and NetFlows. So can it, so you may ask like uh, whether it can be like uh, extended or like uh, to handle these some other data sets or domains for example Z clocks like like and to be broadly used for to our Z community. So the answer is actually yes. So with just like a few simple extensions, this tool is able like to handle the Z clocks. So here I will just like show one simple example. I use the public uh, Z clocks from ARNet and one I use the connection logs um, which contains the richest information among different kinds of logs. And the uh, simple extensions to the NetShare includes the new pre and post processors and just the new configuration files, which is just a few, uh, maybe just tens of lines, I would say. Um, next, I will do like quick, simple live demo of like uh, the dashboard I just have shown, for, but for the Z clocks, but this is computed from a pre-generated Z clocks. I don't have like time to uh, generate like from live here. So, and again, all the data sets code base is, is available on our GitHub repo. I, you can just check it out. Yeah, so if you if you go to like our repo to download this Nashir repo and you just like um, uh, install the package as instructed, so all you need to get that dashboard playing for the uh, Zeek logs is basically you go to the example folders, then you run this uh, visual.zeek.py. And basically this will like compute the metrics like for them distribution of IP address, bytes, uh, service type, connection state uh, from our pre-generated synthetic Zeek logs. And it, this process should be like super fast. It only like takes about like 10 seconds even on my own laptop. And after that, so you will be directed to a uh, local host, a web page hosted on your local host, so, which is the 8000. So if you open that, basically what we will see is the dashboard, like visualizing the uh, different metrics uh, uh, between the real and the synthetic Z clocks. 
So here we have distribution of IP address, port numbers. Uh, I won't have to go over all of these protocols. And you have some bytes, connection state, service types, uh, number of payload bytes, IP bytes sent from originator or responder. So all of these stuff. So what you can see that so like for most of the metrics, uh, uh, Nashville captures them well, but we do have some like uh, metrics that do not perform very well. So which may indicate like some few future tunings. So let's go back to the slides. So again, we don't want just like these numbers or mathematical distributions. Again, we want some like real stuff from applications uh, uh, perspective. So this time we choose like open source Zeek based uh, network traffic analysis called RITA, which ingests the Zeek logs. So the first thing like this RITA reports is the beacon scores, which essentially shows the signs of the beacon behavior in an out of the network. So in this case, we, I show the distribution of the beacon scores. So we see that this, the distribution does not match very well. I mean, especially if you want to compare with the previous applications. So we think the potential reason for this is maybe the computation logic for this beaconing scores is much more complicated than our previous case. For example, detecting the heavy hitters, this stuff. And the second like metric the reader reports is the number of non long connections. So for the real trace, we see about 8% of the long connections. And for our synthetic data, we see about 6.3. So these two ratios, I would say they match much better compared with the beacon scores. And again, I show the duration of the long connections. Again, this, this distribution is not matching very well between the real and the synthetic data. So, but just noted that, so these imperfections may indicate like a future, or like I would say special tuning for the Z clocks because right now all the parameters, all the settings we use is just the default settings we use for the PCAPs and flows. So that's pretty much all like for the technical contents. So Nasher is good, but Nasher is not the end of the world. So it's just the first paper, or I would say the first step towards this like a bigger vision, bigger picture. So we do want to acknowledge like a bunch of limitations and throw out like a series of exciting future work directions. So first is that, so as you may have seen, so for Zeek logs and other like different domains like uh, setups, so we want to extend next year to support more features. So right now we are doing like a stateless unidirection five tuple these flows, but we may want to handle the stateful or session oriented protocols, for example, TCP and Right now we are just generating the headers, but in the future we may also want to generate payloads, which contains much more information compared with the headers. So second is that, so we want to support more downstream tasks, so we only choose like three plus Z1, so four applications, but there are a whole bunch of other applications that are, can be useful to the community. QA inference, device fingerprinting, so on and so forth. So second is about the scalability. So because the limitation of our, like our resources, so right now our evaluation is on like a million scale, a uh, million packet um, scale like uh, PCAPs and flows. So if we, we have like achieved much better like scalability uh, fidelity like uh, trade-offs compared with baselines, but it's still not enough, at least after we talk to like many networking vendors. So they may want like the billion like level these like uh, capabilities to, to generate the synthetic traces. So we want to improve it further. And the last question is also uh, the question we get a lot like from the vendors is the, what are the actual correct privacy properties? So right now, differential privacy is good. It's a leading metric, a popular metric in the literature. But for the actual networking vendors or the actual use cases, they may want more concrete or more intuitive uh, metrics, but just like no one can answer like what's the right metrics to measure the privacy. So a quick summary and takeaway. So just like you need to remember after this talk, so that's so right now we know that like the data driven research has been blocked by the lack of the data, uh, the company research, this stuff. And we now have a new opportunity brought by GANs, I would say deep generative models, uh, for example, transformers. You can use that to generate synthetic network traces. And our work next year shows the early feasibility and the promise of GANs and it's robust across different data sets, domains and downstream tasks. And in the last, I would like to, um, you are more than welcome like, to join us and contribute. So all code-based data sets are publicly available and uh, we just don't have that many number of cycles to, to pursue all these like uh, exciting directions. Um, I guess that's pretty much all of it. Um, thank you so much and I'm happy to take any question. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, I think we have time for one question.
Yeah, you can also like leave questions on, the, uh, I mean, on, on like the Slack, so I can I can yeah, answer that offline. Yeah. Yes. Actually, I, then, then I have one. So, so you're sure. um, talking about extending into payload. Yeah. I was. Um, but one of the talks yesterday in mind, the one on fuzzing, I was wondering if this could be used to generate, to, to fuzz input into a protocol fuzzer, where you wanna you wanna stay within the constraints of the protocol. That's a really that's a really great question. So we actually have another project, so uh, doing like something really similar like to what you just described. So it's basically using GANs like to generate the malicious inputs like to a particular protocol that that will cause this protocol either to blow up or have some like a, a weird like outputs. So um, I think that's a great question, and um, and that's a good application of the GAN. So we think, yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. I'm hoping to see that. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, okay. thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, everyone.